So today we're going to be talking about eggs. Um, so uh, specifically owl eggs, that is. Um, so a little bit about eggs and how they form. And most of the information about how eggs form and what's going on inside the body and, and how this all happens has been done on chickens because obviously chickens are a big industry. Um, there's a lot of money in chickens, so therefore there's also a lot of money that can go into chicken research. So I don't think much of this research has been done on owls specifically, so it's basically chickens, but some of the biology is just basic to birds, period, and then it's a matter of tweaking things a little bit in different species. So what you start with is an ovary. And an ovary in a bird looks like a cluster of grapes. And each one of those is a little egg follicle. And before an egg is um, ready to be ovulated, it'll get big. So I've, I've prepared many birds as museum specimens and you always cut open the body cavity to see if it's a male or a female and you're looking for testes or ovaries. And you're looking for that clump of, of grapes in there. And in birds, because you've got to be light, they're looking to be as light as possible. So normally only the left ovary develops. And I think if I recall correctly, this may not be correct, in excipiters, things like sharp shin hawks, cooper's hawks, things like that, the right ovary may develop also, but I think that's only if the left one is injured, but they're bombing through things that that, that can happen. But most birds just have a left ovary. And then when you're looking at the ovary, you can tell if one is getting ready to ovulate because it'll get big, and then you measure the size of the follicles. Then it will let go, and that's the ovulation, and it goes into the oviduct. And in the oviduct, there's these little tubes where semen can be stored. Um, but a bird can lay an egg without ever copulating or having uh, a male around. So people always ask, are female owls, aside from iris, lay eggs without males around. So Uhu, Piper, um, Alice, they're laying eggs. There's no male around. There's no chance of them being fertilized. They aren't going to hatch. There has to be a male to fertilize, but the semen that's used, the sperm to fertilize that egg is not necessarily something that just came in there. So they have these little storage tubes along the oviduct and in different species of birds, I have no idea how it falls in owls. Um, sometimes it's stored for quite a long time and sometimes shorter periods of time, but they store that. And more than one sperm penetrate the egg. So that's not normal in mammals, but in birds, uh, more than one penetrates. And if too many do, it will actually kill the germ disc, where, so it's not going to work. But anyway, somehow in birds this magically works, and one is the official dad of the egg. And then as it keeps going down the oviduct, then there's some other membranes put on, and then the albumin, the egg whites, there's a thick layer of that that gets put on. So the, the inner part becomes the yolk, that little ovum, the follicle, whatever that started out. And that's mostly fats and proteins. Then you get a membrane, then you get um, the thick layer of the albumin, then you get a thin watery layer of the albumin, and that's mostly proteins and things that are going to help um, keep that egg safe from invading bacteria and then nourish it at the very end. Um, and then as it keeps going down, it goes into the shell gland and that's where the shell gets put on. Um, and then eventually it's going to pop. Oh, and I forgot, there's a couple of, I don't even know how you pronounce it properly, chorizo or something, little rope-like things. If you've cracked open an egg before, you may have noticed there's kind of these ropey things in there if it's a real fresh egg. And those kind of attach things and hold them where they're supposed to be in the egg. Even though the yolk still kind of floats to the top, it keeps it kind of in the middle where it's supposed to be in there. Um, and then comes the egg laying. And the whole egg formation process from the time that follicle is released till the egg is laid in a chicken is something around 20 hours. Now, I would assume it's maybe faster in a smaller bird, slower in a bigger bird, but I don't know that. But anyway, just think of it as roughly around a day to lay an egg. Um, and laying an egg, some of you have maybe watched our cam, and if you sort through our videos on our YouTube channel, you'll see videos of some of our owls laying eggs. And in the great horned owls, if you have the right camera angle, you can really see it coming because the female will start leaning forward and she kind of looks a little bit nauseous. 
and then the feathers on the back of the neck, the hackles will start coming up and the back feathers elevate. They kind of lean forward and it's a process that usually takes maybe five to ten minutes in a great horned owl and you'll see it kind of pressing every now and then. And it, I mean it looks like they're in, in labor. I mean, I suppose if you're pushing something giant out your cloaca, that's uh, not a comfortable thing. And very often when we've got the sensitive microphones close to the owls, you can hear that they're making sounds. So it might be kind of a, <coughs> kind of almost a coughing sound or sometimes more of a <coughs> kind of a sneezy sound. Or in Uhu, our Eurasian eagle owl, it just sounds so painful because she does this. A few times as she's pushing and trying to get that egg out. So those of you who have had babies can probably relate to this, but it doesn't sound nice. It's not like it's just, oh, pops out, there we go. There's, there's effort that goes into laying the egg. Um, now about eggs. Um, let me hold this up here. So this is an egg from Uhu the Eurasian eagle owl. Looks very much like a chicken egg, but a little bit less pointy on one egg. They're made out of calcium carbonate, um, which is bone, chalk, that, that kind of thing. So they're basically taking calcium out of their body and it can take calcium out of their bones to lay that. There's pores all over the surface of the egg. Um, and when I do a close up, you'll be able to see a little bit better. Um, and what those pores do, there's gazillion pores, they allow air exchange. So air has to go back and forth between the inside and the outside. And an egg will always lose weight the longer that it's been out of the body. So from the time it's laid until hatching, apparently very um, equally across species, an egg will lose 14% of its weight until hatching. Now, this is an infertile egg, so it's probably lost more than that amount of weight because Uhu sat on this for about two months before we just removed it a couple days ago. Um, but there is this air exchange. There is a layer on the outside of an egg. Um, so a fertile egg, you don't ever want to wash because that outer layer of the egg is going to help um, prevent a layer of protection against bacteria getting in there. If an egg gets wet, it's more likely that bacteria can get in there and invade the egg and addle the egg. Um, let's see, I've got some notes here. Oh, and eggs are very strong. People always say, how can you have, like, ooh, who weighs five or six pounds? If she's sitting on this, how on earth does she not break that? These are really strong. The shape is very strong. I'm not gonna try and squish this because I don't want gross egg guts going all over the place. Um, but it's a very strong design and the shells are actually quite thick, which you'll see later on because Hein is going to blow out one of these Uhu eggs. So that will be interesting to see, but it is quite a thick shell. Um, you may remember DDT um, affecting eagles, ospreys, peregrine falcons, and that DDT got uh, affected the metabolism of the birds so that their eggshells were too thin and then when they were sitting on them, they crushed them so they weren't having reproduction of birds. I don't think it affected owls that much. One thing that does affect owls are PCBs. Um, so those PCBs can wind up in the yolk of an egg, um, which actually for the mother bird is good because it gives her a way to get rid of PCBs from her body and males don't have that. So in laying eggs, a female can help get rid of some of her PCB load. Um, but some toxins can be stored in eggs, which isn't so good for the, the offspring or the reproduction of the species, but other things can affect owls besides DDT and still currently are. are. Marianne deals that with that in her part of the Netherlands. Um, they have issues with PCBs in eagle owls and it kills the males more frequently than the females because they don't have a way of getting rid of the PCBs from their bodies. Um, timing in intervals, most owls are gonna lay two to five eggs, um, whether they're little or big, kind of the average is two to five eggs, and you get extremes. So if you're a species like a snowy owl, that's really dependent on scarce resources. So you're dependent on lemmings, and some years there's a ton of lemmings, some years there's hardly any, some years there's just a few. 
a snowy owl will not reproduce if there's not an abundance of food. And if they do, they're only gonna lay a few eggs. But if there's a ton of lemmings, they may lay 11 eggs or even more. Um, or something like a short-eared owl that's a ground nester, like a snowy owl, but obviously has a lot of predators. They're nesting in grassy places, on the ground. You're gonna have really high mortality. So again, they are laying up to 11 eggs and sometimes even more. So those really big clutches are for species um, that work in different ways than something like a great horned owl or an eagle owl. If you're an eagle owl or a great horned owl, um, Marianne, she's got some that do great and they lay four eggs and raise four babies and do fantastic. But around here, great horned owls are normally laying two eggs, sometimes three eggs. There was a nest in Saskatchewan this year with five healthy babies, which is, in, that's a record. And it looks like they're all going to survive. I think this is only the second or third documented nest with five babies. But two or three is kind of normal. If you go to the Western US, you may get three or four great horned owls, but they're not having that many because they invest a lot in their eggs and their young and they have really good survival. So you have fewer eggs and fewer babies in the species that they really invest in their babies. Um, so fewer and they do it well. But then you have things like barn owls. Barn owls have really high mortality, but they adapt to that by reproducing more than once per year in some areas. So if you've got a barn owl in a nice warm place with a lot of food, like maybe California or something, and you've got good rains and tons of food, barn owls can have up to three broods per year. Now other owls don't do that. They Once per year, that's it. Um, but they can do up to three broods per year, and they can have five to seven eggs per brood but they don't have as good a hatching success and they have really high mortality compared to other species. So the average lifespan for a barn owl in the United States is probably only one to two years. So really high mortality, but they have really high output. So when they do have babies, they can repopulate quickly. So it's a different reproductive strategy than something like a great horned owl or an eagle owl that has a lot of parental investment and you have really good hatching success and really good success of the young um, surviving. Um, oh, laying, I didn't talk about the timing. Um, birds don't just, well, if you're a chicken, you probably pop out an egg every day. Most owls are gonna be more like a couple of days between eggs, but it varies. And um, our chat room moderators have helped with this, and maybe some of you who have watched our cam have helped also figure out exactly what that egg laying interval is. Because we've got a camera on Iris, our breeding female, and we're able to see exactly when she's laying the eggs. So we've got data on that. Um, did I write it in here? Yes. Uh, so iris is usually right around 72, 73, 74 hours. So 72 hours is three days between laying eggs. Her longest interval was 88 hours. So that's significantly longer. But that was when she was being harassed by wild owls outside. So it's almost kind of like she was hanging on to it and waited till they were gone until she laid the egg. So that was kind of an interesting observation. Alice, uh, my original great horned owl who's now... 23. We finally have a camera angle on her this year so we could see exactly when she laid her eggs and for her she laid three eggs this year and um, it took between 87 and 88 hours um, between those eggs. So she was longer than Iris and Uhu the Eurasian eagle owl this year we were able to figure out exactly when her eggs were laid again because of a different camera angle and it was 80 hours and 90 hours. So 90 hours, you're, that's three and three quarters days. So that's almost four days between eggs. And she laid three eggs this year, but often this she lays four. So there can be some really long time spans between eggs. And egg size is interesting. I'm gonna show you, did I miss something else here? I have a whole lot of notes to cover. Um, cover that, okay. Let's go for a little ride. Hold on. I'm going to take you and show you some eggs. So egg size varies significantly. This is a standard egg carton. These two 
our chicken eggs. So we rarely have, we get them from the neighbors. So these are chickens that are running around outside of different breeds. They're not factory raised chickens. Um, but you know, they're more oval. They tend to be a little bit more pointy on one end. Those are your standard chicken eggs. This is an eagle owl egg. So if I do a lower angle, can you see how big that is? Quite a bit bigger. And it's a little bit more rounded on both sides. Owl eggs, they always say, are round. Um, they didn't ask Piper. Her eggs are not round. Hers are definitely oblong and pointy. And I'm not sure if barn owl, American barn owl, owl eggs always look like this, but if you look at a clutch of her eggs, they are very much pointy. Um, and then on this side of the egg carton, we have Alice the Great Horned Owl's eggs in the back, and these are replica owl eggs. Um, maybe it's a little bit hard to see, but her eggs are bigger than the replica eggs. Let me take these out. Can you see those okay? So this is Alice's, this is the replica egg. So the replica egg is made commercially by bone clones and these are what we've replaced Iris's eggs with in the years that we've not allowed her to hatch eggs um, because we don't have breeding permits anymore. We pull out her eggs after we're sure she's done laying and then we put in fake eggs so she doesn't continue to lay eggs because if she continues, if she says, oh my gosh, they're gone, I'm going to lay another clutch of eggs, that's pulling calcium out of her body, and that can be a little hard on them metabolically. So we put in fake eggs, but these, she's been taking them, but this year, she really looked at them before she sat back down on them after we swapped eggs. Like, really? Are those my eggs? And it, you can see, this one's more yellowish, and I thought, oh, it's just yellowed with time, and her, Owl eggs are just white and they don't need to be different colors because owls are mostly cavity nesters so there's no need to camouflage your eggs. So most owl eggs, actually I think all owl eggs, are pure white. So I contacted the company and I thought, oh well I'm going to get bigger ones. I thought, okay, I'll get snowy owl ones. Yeah, turns out snowy owl eggs, even though snowy owls are bigger than great horned owls, their eggs are smaller because snowy owls lay a lot of eggs. So they have smaller, each egg is smaller. So that wasn't helpful. And it also was yellow. And I contacted the company and they're like, well, yeah, we went to a museum in California. These were the dimensions, this was the color. And I said, that's not what they actually look like. Maybe after sitting in a museum for a long time, they've turned color, but they're white as a hen's egg. Um, the kind you usually buy in the store. So they're actually redoing them white. I said, can you make them bigger, please? Because our birds lay bigger eggs. Um, I don't know that they're going to make them bigger, but a California bird would lay, they're the smallest of the great horned owls, the ones in Southern California and Texas. Um, and unfortunately, that's what they've measured. Uh, the rest of the world has great horned owls that, well, the rest of their range anyway, they lay bigger eggs. So you can see significant size difference there. So we deal with the fake ones that are too small. Um, and then we have, hold on, I have to open this up. And just for reference, this is JR, the Eastern Screech Owl's egg. There's Piper, the barn owl. There's a great horned owl and a Eurasian eagle owl egg. Not sure if you can see. Kind of different angles give you different ideas of how the shapes, the dimensions, the proportions, the depth. So JR, the screech owl, He's a male. Hopefully he's not ever going to lay an egg. He's not supposed to. So this is actually the egg he hatched out of. Um, so you can see when they're hatching, they have to get in 
Let me hang on so I can see what I'm doing a little bit better. There we go. Come on, get the egg in focus. When they're hatching, the chick on the inside has to be in proper position, which apparently for most species is their head tucked under their left wing. And that is proper position. If they're not in the right position, they're not gonna be able to hatch properly out of the egg most of the time. Um, they have an egg tooth on their bill, so it's this little horny, pokey protrusion. And the first thing they do before they hatch is they poke into the air cell on the blunt end of the egg. And what's happened is as that um, egg has lost moisture through the pores over time, um, there's less volume in there, so then you develop an air sac at that end. And the chick breaks into that and starts breathing at that point using its lungs. That's when a chick will start vocalizing inside the egg. So that's when you can start hearing them chitter before they hatch. This is a day or two before hatching. And then, because this is really energetically expensive for them, they're breathing, so they're getting more energy that way. And then they start with their little egg tooth and start working their way like a can opener around their egg to get it open. And this can be a really difficult process. It's very hard for the chick. Sometimes they have to take breaks. Sometimes mom helps them a little bit. Sometimes it literally can take more than a day for them to get out of the eggs. So if you're watching a cam, it can be really nerve wracking. After you see that first pip and then things don't go so good, usually they can make it out, but not always. This one still has the hinge, the top never fully separated from the bottom. Um, Jack Nuzo um, from the Illinois Raptor Center who bred these owls in captivity uh, was hovering over. So I assume this was one of the first eggs that hatched. So I assume Jack assisted a little bit here to make sure JR got out of his egg okay. Um, but usually they'll kick that open and usually the top completely separates. But this is a tough thing for them. And because it's so energetically expensive <clears throat> and they're generating heat in doing this, mom has to sit higher. When she incubates, the female's the only one that develops a brood patch. The male does not. So the male owl cannot incubate eggs properly because he doesn't lose the belly feathers and develop that engorged brood patch with a lot of blood vessels for the really good heat transfer to the egg. Mom usually sits really tight on the eggs, but before hatching, she sits higher on the eggs because these guys are working so hard, they're generating some of their own heat. And if she sits too tight on the eggs when they're hatching or just before hatching, it will actually overheat and kill the young chick in there. And we think that's what happened to Rusty and Iris's first batch of owlets that didn't hatch. They died in the eggs just shortly before hatching. Um, they were very red on their body. And there is a guy in the Netherlands, Arnold Vandenberg, who has studied unhatched eggs and egg failures. I'm going to put the camera back here for a sec. Hold on. This guy knows an absolute ton about avian anatomy and unhatched eggs and he's written a book not for the faint of heart investigating egg failures in birds so it talks about how eggs are formed but then and how the chicks are formed and the growth process but pretty much everything that can go wrong in the process and after you read this book you're amazed that any chick ever makes it out of the egg because there's so much stuff that can go wrong inside of there. Um, this is not a book for the faint of heart. There are tons of graphic pictures in there of developing chicks that have died. So if you're serious and can handle that kind of thing and want to know more, this book is absolutely amazing. Um, Joe has posted the link in chat where you can buy it. Um, you have to buy it from the UK. 
and have it shipped over. It costs, I think, to ship it to the U.S., the cost of the book and shipping is $42. It's not a thick book, but it's fantastic information for anyone who wants to know in depth more about this. But again, do not buy this book unless you can handle this kind of thing, because these are very graphic pictures. Extremely informational, but very graphic. Um, next up, we're going to have, this has to happen anyway, my chief egg blower is my husband, Hein, and uh, we have birds that lay infertile eggs. We blow them out. We, meaning Hein, blows them out, and then we save them for research so we can look at egg shape, size, clutch, whatever, from year to year for each of our birds, because it kind of changes sometimes. So I'm going to ask Hein to come in here and do an egg blowing demonstration. He's going to blow one of Uhu's eggs, which we let her sit on for almost two months. So a little bit nasty in there. If they sit on them for a month, they're fresh as can be when you blow them out. But when it gets to two months, then things start getting interesting. So let me move out of the way and reorganize here. Have to say hi to everybody, hi. Good morning. There's that one. Here, get JR's egg out of the way. Get the book out of the way. Piper's eggs out of the way. Um, all right, and then hold on again. So the first thing he's doing is taking a tack because it's got a strong point on it and Uhu's shells are thick. So I apologize if this doesn't stay in focus during the process. So he has to poke holes in both ends um, so you can blow air in and stuff can come out the other side. And he's got to make the hole just big enough that stuff can come out and he can blow properly. Oh, you can see things have already started running out as soon as he got that other hole. So things could start emptying. Start spilling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That stinks. As I said, the month old eggs don't two months do. And sometimes um, the membranes can kind of clog up in there. Especially on an older egg. Wow, that blew fast. So there's the discolored stuff in there that, so this is basically the whites, the yolks, everything have kind of decomposed together inside there. Um, there's the egg itself. couple of holes. You can, if you s can see really close and can see the texture, you can see the pores and the eggs also. Maybe not. Yeah, so then the next step, which Hein will do elsewhere, is he will blow water into there and slosh it around <laughs> to uh, clean it out and then blow that water out and then we just let them dry. And then each egg is labeled as pipers are with the bird and the year. So we keep data on these and then in a database we have the rest of the data that goes along with them, like how much they laid, the dates they were laid, when we removed them from the bird. Okay, you want to retreat to the kitchen? Have a nice day. Well that went fast. That went extremely fast. Do we have questions? We do. Okay. The first one, um, let's see, if there's a day, uh, this person incubates chicken eggs for their students. If there's a delay between acquiring the eggs and starting incubation, uh, they've been told to gently turn the eggs once or twice a day so the contents don't get stuck. 
does that have something to do with the spindle type fibers that you were referring to? Oh, um, I don't know if I can give you a positive answer to that. Um, I'm not sure if you have to, because um, in other birds, like if incubation is delayed, um, most owls will start incubating with the first egg being laid so that you have an asynchronous hatch. Um, but some, like pygmy owls, um, and sometimes little owls, and even great horns can delay it some, sometimes they lay that first egg. A pygmy owl will lay the whole clutch. They just plain sit there until they start incubating. And I've been told that you can hold eggs like in refrigeration for some time, even without turning them. But if they told you to turn them, I would definitely do what they say, because chicken people ought to know what they're talking about. It probably increases the chances of a successful hatch. It's maybe not essential, but probably better, if that's what they're telling you. But I'm not an expert on that, for sure. Speaking of turning, Mark asks, how often do great horned owls rotate their eggs? Ooh, good question. Um, I'm going to ask some of our chat room moderators. Do you remember? Because I don't know that we kept track of exactly how often they turned their eggs. We try to, but sometimes it was very hard to see. Um, so basically we have no idea. Yeah, but it's at least every couple of hours, you think? More yeah. than that? Yeah, but I can't give you a definitive number. No idea. Maybe something for next year. Yeah, so this is a place where cams can come in really handy if you've got a lot of people watching a cam um, and we had, we've used Excel spreadsheets or Google Sheets. So they're shared documents and then had cam viewers document incubation breaks. And we found that the females usually take a break in the morning and in the evening. And then there may be some others besides that, but those are kind of like your two standard breaks that they take. Um, and sometimes they may not take other breaks. And then we looked at how cold it is and how long the break is in relation to that and what can an egg withstand and still be able to hatch which is more informative when you have a, a, a mother that's not a good incubator, that's not sitting tight on the eggs. Um, we have a question, is egg binding a concern for our owls? How would we know if an owl is experiencing it and needs some intervention? <laughs> good question. I haven't experienced it with our birds yet. Hopefully we don't, um, but we could, absolutely. They're birds of prey can have egg binding also. I'm not sure the symptoms. I mean, I would assume there's some signs of distress or pushing or extended, you know, the labor part um, or maybe looking ill. Um, I hope I don't have to find that one out, but it, it can actually kill a bird. They can have an egg get crushed in the oviduct, which may or may not pass, but it's, it's a serious thing um, that I haven't had to deal with yet. My dad's cockatiel got egg bound and ended up having to be put down because of it. Oof. So how did she behave? Um, just kind of sick and like leaning over like she wasn't comfortable. Okay. That's good to know. Um, Susan asks, what is, in it, what, what is involved with having a breeding permit? Why would you have one versus not having a permit? Okay. Breeding permits. Um, you have to have a reason to have a breeding permit. We can't just say, oh, we're going to let the owls breed and raise babies because A, what do you do with them? B, they're probably not going to let you release them to the wild. And, you know, then are you raising them to be education birds? And if so, you need to take them away from the parents at a young age. Um, we had breeding permits for Rusty and Iris for research purposes to look at the vocal development of uh, young owls because you can't really do it with wild ones. You can have the best nest cam in the world, but those young ones all leave the nest before they're vocally mature. And then there's no transmitter that you can put on a bird that transmits audio and their juvenile vocalizations are, you know, when do they start sounding like adults? There was literally no way to do it in the wild. So we were able to get breeding permits for Rusty and Iris who were permanently injured and not able to be released to the wild. They just had eye injuries, so they were capable of breeding and then we observed them with security cameras and microphones. And now because Rusty's vision is really limited, he's only got one eye and poor vision in that eye, he's, he's not physically up for raising kids anymore, so they're officially retired. We no longer have breeding permits. 
Um, and at this stage of the game, the only reason to get a breeding permit would be to raise them to be education birds for other facilities or, or our own facility, but it would be mostly other facilities. And that's kind of not something that I want to do at this stage of the game. It's not something that's easily given, that's for sure. Okay, uh, Amanda asks, have you considered making molds of the eggs they do lay to get a more exact size? I offered that we could maybe do that for bone clones. And they said, because eggs ship them, I mean, you know, I swear they play football with packages when you ship them sometimes. They just don't trust the shipping process. So when they've made molds, it's only at a place where they can literally go and do it with the egg and drive back without transporting the egg at all. And they're in California, so we're nowhere near that. I'm not sure how to do a, a mold of an egg. Somebody that, probably knows how to do that, but I don't. That was part of the suggestion that we do it here. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be open to doing it if somebody can tell me how. Let's see. Um, when the female takes an, a nest break, how long might that last? Okay, so nest breaks probably are different in different species. We've mostly looked at great horned owls, and most of them seem to be in the ballpark of 10 minutes, 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes. Um, and I know at some of the nests in warmer locations, it can be longer than that, but we're in Minnesota, so it's, it's winter when they're um, incubating eggs. So typically I would say 10 minutes. Some individuals are really tight and short about their breaks. Some are a little more lax, but somewhere in that ballpark. They're not long. Carla? Yeah. Can I interrupt? Because we've kept um, track of a nest in Canada where it was quite cold and also of Mrs. Harvey. Yeah. Um, and they, I mean, the one in, uh, in Canada did leave the nest for three hours when it was really cold and she still had um, success. So some, even in colder areas, could go away for longer periods of time, but it's not typical, I think. Right, it's not a typical nest break. And Miss Harvey is kind of an atypical example because she was not a good incubator at all. So she did take very long breaks, but very often she had chicks that didn't hatch also. But with Ellie, they did hatch. That was the most wonderful thing to see. Yeah. Just, just one of the things we saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the anomalies are the more informative things than the averages, because if everybody's taking their normal breaks and everything hatches, we didn't... <laughs> but when you have one that you can say, it was this cold, it was in Canada, she was gone three hours and the chicks still hatch, you know, at what part of incubation, you're actually really learning something then. And even Miss Harvey, who has the eggs that don't hatch, then you can say, this kind of breaks don't work or are iffy if an egg is gonna hatch. We have a few more questions, but it's almost 1045. Okay, um, do you wanna handle, do you wanna do a little quickie tour and maybe handle some questions while I get? Sure. JR is gonna take me a while to get because he's our screech owl and he doesn't wear dresses, so I actually have to put them on before I bring them in. So it might be a little bit yet. So I'll turn it over to Joe. Okay, so I also saw um, when cleaning the eggs, I was surprised by how liquidy the material was. Is the one, is the material ever thicker uh, in wild bird eggs? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think I will leave that one for when Carla gets back because I'm not sure. Um, how do we have information about how long males and females are fertile? Um, well, Rusty is in his 20s now, um, and he's he's starting to, he start, he's not starting to, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's not fertilizing eggs much anymore. Um, that said, there have been females that are you know, late 20s and they're still laying eggs that are per perfectly fine. So I don't have um, a ton of information on that, but you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of variation. Uh, are there predators that invade all boxes? Absolutely, yes. Um, sometimes you'll get um, bigger owls, 
um, that doesn't happen a ton that will eat the, the young. Um, sometimes uh, ground predators like raccoons can, can go up into the nest. Um, I've heard of squirrels going in and, and taking eggs out of like screech owl nests, which seems like a bad choice on the squirrel's part, but they're about the same size as the, as the screech owl. So um, snakes, large snakes like uh, bull snakes can go up into the, into the nests and eat smaller eggs. So yeah, there definitely are um, predators that will go in and, and eat the eggs. Um, I'm going to do a uh, screen share here. Let's see. That's the one I want. So I am sharing, I'm not going to do a full uh, website tour because most of you have, have been here for the last few weeks and you kind of know what's going on. Um, I'm going to center more on some more specific things. So we do have a ton of resources on our website. Um, if you want to help teach people about owls or even learn about them yourself, we have educator resources. That's down here under educator resources, under resources. Um, so there's a really fun, a fun song about dissecting owl pellets. Um, you can find the, the bone sorting charts if you're dissecting pellets, threats to owls by the Raptors or the Solution group. Um, these are some really cool uh, resources here. If we go to the links section, that's also under educator resources down at the bottom, there are a ton of links that you can go to to find out more about owl stuff. The owl pages is a fantastic resource, owling.com, um, a lot of more Minnesota centered places. There are other owl festivals in other parts of the world. There's one in Florida, there's one in Wisconsin, there's a huge festival in Italy, which is really cool. That's like all owls and thousands and thousands of people come and, and uh, visit that. So that's really neat. Um, you can find more about education and rehab um, in various states here. Um, I like owlproject.org in South Africa. They're pretty cool. Scottish Owl Center in Scotland. Um, the Raptor Education Group in Antigo, Wisconsin is where um, Rusty, Iris, and Alice, our great horned owls, came from. Um, so these are some really neat resources over here. If you want to learn about owl conservation, that's over on this side. Um, so there's the Global Owl Project, the World Owl Trust in England. Um, lots of options here for helping um, do like citizen science. You don't have to be a uh, uh, trained, well, you have probably should be trained, but you don't have to be a, um, you don't have to go to school for years and years and years to, to help with it, to help with conservation and research. Um, you can actually just help on your own by watching a nest cam or something like that. Um, there are owl conferences once in a while, all kinds of owl art and merchandise that's not in our store. Um, other links, uh, the National Eagle Center is also in Minnesota. That's a really neat spot. The Creighton Foundation in Wisconsin, the Wolf Center, Bear Center up in Ely, Minnesota. So I definitely recommend checking out these links if you're interested in those kinds of animals as well. And then the other links that I like to show are up here under our research, and that's in background info. Um, so if you have questions specifically about great horned owls, we have so many resources here. Um, we've got history of Rusty and Iris. Um, we have, let's see, um, if you have questions about what happened to Rusty and Iris's kids, there's an owl glossary. Um, this has any owl <laughs> terms that you want to learn about, you can learn about them here. Um, and one last thing before I go back to Carla, uh, we do have some specific facts about great horned owls. Um, so if you have any questions about age or weight or diet um, or other things like that, you can, you can get to that from this page. So once again, that is under our research and background info. 
And I see Carla is back with JR, so I'm gonna turn it back over to her. Okay, so this is JR, the Eastern Screech Owl. He's full grown, he's not gonna get any bigger than this. It was his egg um, that you saw that he hatched out of. He's busy looking at the computer. Hold on, let me pick up his egg. Pick up your egg. That's what he came out of. That's what he hatched out of. That's what he grew into. Um, so this is in the Eastern US, this is the smallest owl that we have around with ear tufts. Um, and I should maybe go back why we have him because we're talking about eggs. His parents are non-releasable birds that work at the Illinois Raptor Center as education birds. They both have eye issues. They assumed they were both females based on size and they had them housed together. And then one year there were eggs. And as we know, females can lay eggs that are infertile so they didn't think anything of it, except they hatched. So Jack went up to get his camera immediately and came back and um, the parents were eating their babies. Um, and apparently that happens with screech owls in captivity sometimes. So he got breeding permits after that and then pulled the eggs and incubated them and hatched them out. So JR is part of the first batch that he hatched out with the intention that they would be hand raised so they would be very comfortable being education birds. So you can see he's totally comfortable, not stressed out. Sometimes he likes to watch the computer because that's interesting and things move. Um, but it makes for owls that are very comfortable education birds when they're captive reared. So we got the very first one that he placed. JR is red. They come in gray also. So Eastern Screech Owl have two color morphs. Uh, the Western Screech Owl just mostly comes in gray, uh, but he's a beautiful little redhead. And although he does have ear tufts, you can see they're not sticking up. It means he's totally relaxed. If he were alert, if you watch some of the videos of him on Facebook, you'll see his ear tufts sticking up. Sorry, I'll put your ear tuft back down there. Um, but he's quite the handsome dude. These uh, little jesses that we have, or maybe you heard him, he did a little trill there. The jesses that he wears are only when he's out of his aviary during pro doing programs. Most owls have feathers on their tarsi, on their legs, and the jesses on some species and some individuals will rub those feathers. So his his legs look kind of bare right now. We haven't had jesses on him for months, but because it just rubbed the feathers and didn't pull them out, he hasn't grown new ones. This summer he will, during his molt, grow new ones. Um, so for now, he still looks nice, but screech owls go through really extreme molts where their head, oh my gosh, it's, yeah, they look a bit like aliens. He's like, hey, take my jesses off, man. So questions about JR or eggs? I see a hand raised um, from Rosetta. I'm not sure if she has a question. Um, there was a question earlier that someone asked that I wasn't able to answer. Um, when cleaning eggs, I was surprised by how liquidy the material was. Is the material ever thicker or the yolk more fo formed in wild bird eggs? Um, that's probably a matter of that it had been sat on for two months. Um, so if you blow it out after one month, then it's more like just blowing a chicken egg. I mean, it, it's got your normal yolk that you have to scramble up in there because otherwise it won't come out because it's an intact blob. Um, so it's just a matter of how long it had sat before it was blown out. Joyce asks, is JR imprinted? Was he raised to not be imprinted? And what can you tell us about the imprinting process? Okay, imprinting is not a cut and dried thing. Uh, he was raised with his three siblings and I think one other wild one that was brought in. And um, typically, if they're raised with others of their species, even if they're around humans, then they imprint on the proper species and he would grow up knowing he's a screech owl. But based on his behavior, he acts like an imprint. So he's very vocal with humans. He copulates with my head in the spring. He's just about done with that now. 
Um, so he, he totally acts like an imprint, even though he was raised with other screech owls. If he was raised by himself, by people, he would definitely be imprinted on humans. So imprints are just, it's, it's who they orient towards. So normally if a young bird, when their eyes are first focusing, yeah, you want those off. What they see taking care of them is what they think they are. So that's the imprinting process. Normally that's mom or dad and they grew up knowing they're the right species. Now, when they're raised by humans, that's where things start going weird. And if you have them living in captivity as an education bird, imprinting can be good or not good, depending on the species. So a human-imprinted female great horn can be very aggressive, <clears throat> like Alice. She has no fear of humans whatsoever, and she's got talons, and she knows how to use them if, if she's cranky, and female great horned owls are the reason for the word owly, I think. Um, so it depends on the species. I mean, if you have a male screech owl copulating with your head, no big deal. Male great horned owl copulating with your head, uh, that's more of a problem that Joe knows about. <laughs> yep, it's, it's not fun. Uh, will we ever get more owls? Where would they come from? Uh, we will most, very most likely get more owls and yeah, where do they come from? That's the trick. So you can get them from rehabbers, but owls do best if you get them very, very young. So it would have to be a young one that came in with an injury that they know is permanent from the get-go, so it could be raised by humans, or one that was confiscated from somebody who illegally raised it and imprinted it. Or you can get it from somebody that's breeding owls, which hardly anybody does, so there's massive demand and really hard to get. So it's it's tricky to get one that'll be a good education bird. Are eastern or western screech owl populations on the decline? Mm, good question. Population level data is really hard with owls because how do you survey them? You know Christmas bird counts are great for most of the diurnal birds but owls aren't seen as much as other birds on the Christmas bird counts. So it's really hard to say. Um, I think in Minnesota, there's belief that screech owls are declining. Now we're, where we live in the Root River Valley, we still have plenty of them, but I think elsewhere in Minnesota, there's fewer. I have no idea on Western screech owls, so I honestly can't say. Anything else? I didn't see any other questions from before. Do you want to just look really close at JR? Whoops. <laughs> he's looking at something, aren't you? See how he's holding his head still? He was looking at something outside. What do you think, JR? You think so. He'll be happy to go back to his aviary and have his justice taken off. Okay, well, it looks like we can wrap up on time. You're not going to pop out a pellet, are you? Next week, we're going to be talking specifically... I'll try and talk specifically about Rusty and Iris, our great horned owl um, breeding pair. Well, they have been our breeding pair for research, and we'll talk about not so much about the vocal research, but about Rusty and Iris personally and what happened to them, why we've had them, what they've gone through for injuries health-wise, raising babies and some of their kids. And um, so that's what we're gonna talk about next week. So thanks for joining us. Um, if you're on our e-newsletter list, you will get the link to the program. Otherwise you'll be able to find it on the homepage of our website. So thanks for joining and hope to see you next week. Bye, everybody. So thank you all for joining us. If you like the program, subscribe to our channel, follow us on Facebook, and consider becoming a member. Check out the links in the description below. Be safe, and thanks for making the world a better place for owls.